This is Unipal Air Base in Thailand. We've been operating B-52s from here since April of 1967. It's not a glamorous job. The crews take off on a scheduled time. They fly relatively straight and level and deliver the ordnance. And then they fly back to prepare the aircraft for the mission tomorrow. The men of these machines are real pros who carry briefcases with them. They follow checklists and operate as a team, producing very positive results. Okay, again, we'll be clearing right here. Right, sir. A little yeah. more air. A little more air for the chute. Right side. You clear right tail. Of course, the crews understand what the mission is. The meanest guys understand what the mission is. They're operating in a combat environment, so they're highly motivated. However, it takes more than that to convince the individual that uh, the job that he's doing has to be done professionally, and it's, uh, it's real important to the national security of the United States. So people coming into theater are often very amazed at uh, how we employ junior officers and junior airmen here. We give our junior people the authority and the responsibility and turn them loose. What little guidance they, uh, they require, why, of course, we give it to them. But in most cases, the uh, individual is so well motivated so well trained out. We put them in a specific job here, and because the, of the standardization procedure that we employ in SAC, uh, the individual can fall right into the pattern with no additional training. That's Captain Dietrich's aircraft parking right now. His crew is typical of the men who've been flying out here. After they unload, they go in for the operational debriefing. George Dietrich, Captain, Pilot Commander in official language, Old Pit Horse, come from Concanic, Pennsylvania. The number two man is Dick Stone. He's married and has a two-year-old son. Six years in the Air Force, all in SAC. Three hours and a half. From very nice short mission. Three and a half. Two and a half hours. Right. The fuel curve is straight on, all the way down the line. I have the front range track here. Not really. Bob Watson is a radar navigator. We used to call it Bombardier. Commissioned through aviation cadets six years ago. Wife's name is Mary. They have a daughter about a year old. This is the navigator. First Lieutenant Stephen Selling. He's 25. Comes from Laconia, New Hampshire. No children yet. He has a degree in history from Syracuse. Ken Newman is the electronic warfare officer. He operates the Jambers. He used to be an electronic technician in civilian life. Has two children, both girls. Both on the beach. Staff Sergeant A.B. Johnson. At 32, he's the old man on the crew. Major veterinary medicine at Tuskegee. Used to be a curator of reptiles at the Miami Serpentorium. It's very important that we recognize uh, how the crew members and the individuals feel, and I think I've got a reasonably good feel on what the reaction of most of the individuals are to our participation in this, uh, this conflict over here. Uh, you couldn't ask for a better, better artillery than the B-52. You can never see a bomb going up, but you can see the uh, smoke and dust coming up through the top of the foliage. And right about the middle of the bomb train comes this great big white bulbous cloud, and it just comes streaming up. It's about four times the size of everything else. And the things will go off underneath the pulley, and uh, you'll never even see the explosion. It looked like the whole target area looked like a dead rat shaking up the water. It just sat there, just trembled. Yeah. And you can see the bombs walking out the other side of it. Again. So there was no fire or smoke associated with it. And, uh, but, uh, have to be something buried that uh, didn't 
come to the surface. That's where the real satisfaction comes from, though, on these missions, where you go out and you can see the ground and you get secondary. And we very seldom hear what happens on some of these, like this operation Grass Hill or a couple of other big drives that they pulled on. How much did we actually contribute to the operation? You're kind of, like you said, you're very, you're, you're, you're in it, but you're remote. I think uh, once after you gain the, the confidence of the people in the wing, I, uh, it's a very simple matter to be able to talk to these individuals, whether they're the flight crews, uh, staff officers, uh, particularly the maintenance and support guys. They're typical American guys. They're highly motivated, uh, have the drive and desire to, uh, to be professionals. Saigon, and they took me through uh, MACV, where they do all the, uh, the mission planning, lay on the target. Boy, I can tell you, there's some pretty good thinking behind it. And I think the best thing we could do here is perhaps go over to MACV, talk with Brigadier General Chasen. He's the man in charge of MACV target assignments, and he can give us the full picture. It'll give you an idea on how the targets are selected and why sometimes it's necessary, even at the last minute, to make a change in our target. Well, the targets that we request be struck are selected from two sources. One source is the uh, tactical commanders in the field, and they select targets in direct support of their operations, just as they would select a tactical air target or a deep artillery target. I would say this accounts for the majority of the uh, targets that we have nominated for strike. Then there's another source of targets that come from the intelligence analysts, both in the field commands and here at this level. And they're primarily analyzing targets uh, of enemy supply lines, or enemy supply caches, or enemy base areas. And then on a daily basis, the targets from these two sources come into this headquarters and they're analyzed here in the uh, Combat Operations Center. I think as long as you keep in mind that when we're talking about B-52 strikes, uh, we're talking about pre-planned type of strikes. We're not talking about something that we want to hit with haste because we're talking about such big payloads and we're bringing them in so close to the troops the use that we're making of the B-52 out here is as another tactical support weapon on the immediate battlefield. Uh, and in that capacity, I think it's been extremely effective. This is both based on my observation and what I'm sure you will find in discussing the subject with the tactical commanders. Uh, we find that the, the greatest effectiveness of the B-52 is this big payload. This is a very fine thing to be able to put on a target that has some impact upon your operation when you're a tactical commander. Uh, also, we like the fact that uh, it can be delivered around the clock, uh, regardless of weather, with the same general accuracy in all conditions. Uh, it can be delivered with a great deal of what we call shock effect upon the enemy, because there's really no signal that the attack is coming. Uh, and 
as we've recently experienced in some of our strikes in the Quezon area, we know we can bring them in quite close to our own friendly troops. I think an interesting story on troop reaction came out of Quezon here. It was the uh, first day that we brought one of the B-52 strikes in real close to the Marine position. And uh, one would have thought the Marines would have been probably down in their dugouts, uh, staying out of the way. Uh, but the story is that they were all standing up on top of the bunkers, cheering as the B-52s were being uh, delivered outside of their position. I think this attests to the fact that they're very pleased with the effectiveness. And I'd suggest that if you're one to get some more on this, that you should go out and talk to some of the troop commanders and some of the troops themselves. And I think you'd get a very clear insight as to the effectiveness of this weapon. General Pierce, uh, as commander of the first field force, what has been your association? Well, my job primarily with the B-52 is to establish the priority. First thing you know, on this that you have to recognize is that a B-52 strike is a priceless commodity. And we have many, many more targets and we have B-52 strikes available. So as a consequence, we have to set these up as a matter of priority in order that we can put the proper weight on the proper target. Uh, how are the troops in the field? Uh, the troops, of course, this is one of the big things aside from the physical destruction is the fact that it is a tremendous morale boost for our own. They, can, they get these things, they know they're confronting, let's say, an infantry regiment, and they get this arc light strike or B-52 strike out there, and they know that this is going to take quite a bit of the pressure off. So you can say on the one hand that it's decidedly good for the morale of our own forces, I think what is equally as important is the fact that in all of the prisoners and the Hoi Chans that we've interrogated, we asked them, what are the things that you dislike most, or what are the things that uh, you fear most? And you find that they come out, generally speaking, with pretty pat answers. They don't like the B-52 strikes. They don't like TAC air. They don't like the gunships, the helicopter gunships. And they don't like our children. <coughs> get on down and talk to uh, the combat unit, talk to one of these platoons in the front line and ask one of those people how they feel about it. I'd like to have them uh, change their minimum distance on it, to kind of their maximum distance for it. I believe it ought to be in close, ought to be able to come in closer to the troops, especially if they're on high ground, especially the area we just came from. It, it really gives me and the people uh, a feeling of security when, they, when you do hear them. You know if you're going to move into that area, you're not going to run into anything. Great feeling to be sitting there watching them bombs hit the ground. Uh, we did see uh, arc lights going off on the other side of the ridge, about seven or eight clicks away. Yeah. Off in the distance, you can hear the constant boom, 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 boom. And, you know, everybody just kind of smile, you know. Just like with a feeling of security is with any plane, any kind of plane, the Sky Raider, but a B-52 is like the biggest feeling of security. Really appreciate them coming in, coming in. It's a morale boost for everybody. I know about the most secure thing I've had in Vietnam so far was one morning we got about 7:30, 8 o'clock, where there was about 15 or 18 B-52s. It was a beautiful sight. It was, it was damn near as good as a mail call. <laughs> the morale factor in it. When you have been out there, you really begin to get an appreciation of what we're doing out here. Well. I got an early mission in the morning, so I think I'm going to take off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's time. Okay. Let's okay. get the bus. I'll see you up there. All right. Okay. So we've had uh, many, many cases here where, where people reel back home, perhaps, and we've uh, permitted them to call back and chat with their wives or their uh, mothers, as the case might be. This way, they're, they're reassured that everything is A-OK -okay back there, and this puts the individual in a position where he can perform well. He has nothing on his mind. Of course, there's nothing more dangerous than a guy working on an airplane with some concern over some problem back home. It's extremely dangerous. We recognize it. We work real hard that these lads will highlight their problems to us, and they do. Roger Control, 100 is out of the ball game. My hip pocket spare is 604. Give me a reading, please. Roger. 
We'll take aircraft 604. Uh, how's the refuel coming? You first drive. And now I'm on Bob Road. Okay. Roger control. Refuel should be complete on 604 at 2100. Be ready for Mickey Mouse at 2130. I'll have MMS out there at that time. Roger, this is turning around aircraft now. When you consider it takes four to five hundred man hours to regenerate an airplane once he returns from a mission, I think the people become more aware of the fact that uh, the only way you can do this is through is a good coordinated team effort because each individual has played a very important part in getting that airplane off the ground. We have a very sophisticated radar bombing navigation system. So weather has absolutely no bearing on our capability to bomb. We can pinpoint bomb through uh, overcast uh, conditions, uh, under any weather conditions. Gentlemen, in 10 seconds, the time will be 0300 local, 2000 Zulu. Five, four, three, two, one, hack. Colonel Bakery, gentlemen, Captain Wright, briefing the Able 88 mission. The classification of this briefing is secret. The airborne commander is Colonel Moore. The room is secure. The takeoff time for the first cell is 0500 local. Roll call. Major Lund. Captain Dietrich. All present, sir. Major Brooks. Takeoff time for the second cell is 0520 local. Roll call. Captain Dilworth. Major Eldridge. Major Lee. Climb out on the standard departure route. Level off at Point Bravo. Proceed to Point Charlie. To Point Delta. And at point Delta, start climb to flight level 360. Proceed to point Echo, to the IP. Open your bomb doors 30 seconds prior to release on your primary target X-ray 26. After your release, break right to point Foxtrot and proceed to the alternate IP. For a release on the alternate target, open your bomb doors 30 seconds prior to release on X-ray 3-0. Proceed to point Golf and join the return route to Utapau. Lieutenant Nichols for weather. Good morning, gentlemen. Good takeoff weather at Utapau. 3-8 to strata Q at 2,000 feet. Some sear strata at 30,000 feet. Visibility greater than six miles. Surface winds from the south at 10 knots. Temperature 83, pressure altitude plus 60. Altimeter setting 29 or 9 or 1. We got it. Got a top fat leaking on the JC-12. No, no condition we're going to have to drop the change. Did you get one order for it? Okay, I'll get one on order. Start taking that one down right, right away. Control, we have a JFC 12 change on 604. Sergeant has been ordered by OMS 12, control number 081. Sergeant Lemons for intelligence. Your primary target is against the Quezon area where there is a large 
confirmed troop concentration buildup and storage area. Down to the south, your alternate target is against troop concentrations between Pleiku and Kantum. Also confirmed that a large Viet Cong force is moving in from Laos. Intelligence, ground action for yesterday in the First Corps, the target area. Control OM-10. Roger Control 604 is NNN across the board. Complete at 0250. All game. Complete is good. Uh, Roger. Roger. Uh, what was your going home now? I have a cool one for me. Roger Control. I'm strictly a Kool-Aid man. Thank you. Are there any questions on the mission as briefed? Would you rise, please, for Chaplain Clarahan? Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, bless these crews, the leaders they follow, the men who support them. Help them to be the men you want them to be. Keep them safe from all harm, and let what they do today bring a better tomorrow. Bless their families and loved ones. Give to them the same peace and security that these men try to bring to the world today. Amen. The specific model of B-52 that we're using in this theater is the B-52D. It's the only B-52 in the uh, SAC force that has had the big belly modification. The airplane uh, was not originally designed to carry iron bombs, so to achieve this end, this modification was uh, necessary. As far as general characteristics of the bird are concerned, it's better than 180 feet from wingtip to wingtip, 156 feet long, and our operating gross weights uh, out of Thailand or in the neighborhood of 400,000 pounds. Check co-pilot, altimeter is 2990. 
elevation error, 50 feet. Okay, pilot 2990, I have a correction of plus one. 2990, zero correction, co pilot. SCM at this time. Uh, pilot Nav. Roger Nav. Got me a pump bomb run hitting the 281. 281, you want that heading now? Roger. Okay, turning 281. Roger, pilot. EW, co pilot, so picking up any signals. Oh, Roger, co pilot, just the normal acquisition signals, uh, no threats at this time. Radio ready for bomb run checklist. Roger, stand by. Roger, BNS 281, Compass Mag heading cross check. Cross check. BNS altitude. Set. Nav mode, select switch. That's brief. Roger. Cross here is naming point. Stand by one. Aiming point. Stand by one. Roger. Not now, sit in. Roger. Checking. Number one. Looks good. Looks good. Go back to. Roger. Okay, set. Roger, officer switches is desired. Yes, desired. Your primary control function switch bomb. Bomb. Pilot, what direction is PDI pointing? Uh, it's about six left. Could you center, please? Centering PDI. Primary control function switch bomb. Going bomb now. In bomb. Roger. Release configuration check. You ready for it? Roger, go ahead. Roger, release circuit disconnect. Connect the light on. Pop indicator light switch. It's on. PDI center. Roger, pilot. Rack loaded light switch. On. Master bomb control switch. It's on. Release power switch. It's on. Bomb door control valve lights are off. Roger, checked off. Bombing system switch manual. Manual. Bomb doors open to 30 TG, coming up on 30 TG. 30 TG. Roger. Yeah, engineer coming up. Roger. Doors checked open. Roger, that completes the checklist. Ready, ready, now. Doors open. Roger, standing by release. PDI, sir. Roger. Coming up on countdown, zero, six, zero, now. Release. Emergency bomb Four. door open switch. Off. Bomb doors. Closed. Master bomb control switch. Off. Train display mode, select the switch. SB. Train computer power switch. SB. Process switch. On. L2 disable switch. Normal. Nav mode, select switch. As desired. Radar camera switches. As required. Vertical camera doors. Closed. Landing gear, standby pumps off, pilot and the portable hydraulic packs shut down. They're off and checking. Monitoring system select switch, standby. Internal brick. Train zero. External brick. Train zero. Release circuit disconnect, I'll get. Disconnected light off. 
Release power switch off. Priming switch. Say. Bomb bay walkway lights, circuit breakers. I oh, am. Yeah. Optional bombing switch. Normal. Complete checklist. Right. Complete. Yellow anchor six for the zero five departure control. Radar contact. Thank you, pilot. Report level at seven thousand. What's fuel quantity, main vehicle? We've got plenty of gas, and we we're right on the fuel curve here about five minutes ago. On course, on glide path, one mile from touchdown. Heading 180. Precision minimum altitude. Right, there's 30 feet below glide path. Over approach line. Uh, Roger, our transport's here. Uh, we cleared in. The crews come over into this part of the world quite frequently. Six months at a stretch. And in many cases, the crews find themselves back home for a very short period of time and they're back again for another six-month period. Operating out of Guam, it's very confining. There's very little for the, uh, for the crews to do there. So when they have an opportunity to come to uh, Utapau, they're very happy to come over here. So we make every effort in the world to schedule them in such a manner so that each crew during his 18-day cycle has an opportunity to spend perhaps uh, at least two days in the Bangkok area. I think it's very educational. I think uh, because of the, um, the professionalism that these individuals display on and off the job, it's very healthy for them to become exposed to the Thai people. Uh, they have a better understanding of our people, uh, the way we conduct business, the way we conduct ourselves in the Thai community. Many, many crew members uh, work uh, very hard toward establishing better base community relations. I've seen this happen here in the local area so many, many times. We've received so many congratulatory messages, letters and uh, things of this nature from Thai dignitaries, Thai families, indicating how pleased they were to be able to uh, get to know SAC crew members and have the SAC crew members spend some time in their homes uh, at their table. It's very enlightening. Aircraft have been recycled and another mission is launched. Perhaps the crews feel a bit more fulfillment since they know what their efforts achieve. Even though professionally speaking, it's just another mission. They are professionals, highly trained and qualified in the specialties. It is also a fact that they are men doing a good job. The reasons are diverse. However, they all have one thing in common. They're here because their country needs them.